Please have a seat. Perhaps if you're uh, back with us for the second time after last week, uh, just to explain, on Sunday evenings we're looking at a part of the Bible called Matthew's Gospel. Matthew was an eyewitness of Jesus and his gospel is the write-up of what he saw and heard. So if you're still just thinking through what you believe, uh, Matthew's gospel is some of the evidence that you need to make your mind up about. And if you're already trusting in Jesus, it is there to make you more confident about why. So would you grab one of the Bibles and open it to page 814? Uh, page 814, that will get you to Matthew chapter 9. Uh, it comes up on screen, but it sort of comes and goes. It's good to have it open in front of you to uh, check that uh, what I'm saying is actually there. Uh, page 814, Matthew chapter 9, and we're picking it up again at verse 18. So the bottom left-hand side of the page. You'll see that the, uh, the Bible translators... Uh, have stuck in the heading a girl restored to life and a woman healed. I'm calling this Jesus master over mortality. Jesus master over mortality. And I, I want to read it through again first so that it's fresh in our minds. So chapter 9 verse 18. While Jesus was saying these things to them, behold a ruler, in other words a leader in the community, came in and knelt before Jesus saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who'd suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, for she said to herself, if I, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly... The woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And unsurprisingly, the report of this went through all that district. Before we go on, let me uh, lead us in prayer. Father, thank you that you have spoken to the world by sending your Son into it, in the person of Jesus. Help us, as we look at what he did here, to see what it means for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Matthew tonight, we meet two women. Uh, well, one is just a girl. She has her life to look forward to. Her parents are looking forward to seeing her grow up, and then she gets sick and dies. And you've, you've seen the headline in, in the local newspaper over and over again. Girl age 12, robbed of life. And then the other woman, she's been robbed in a different way. Not robbed of life, but robbed of anything like normal life because she's been chronically sick for 12 years. Years, Maybe she's, she's the friend of yours or mine on, on dialysis, whose answer to every invitation is, so, sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't. What's your reaction to stories like that? Here's the playwright George Bernard Shaw's reaction. He wrote, how are atheists produced? In nine times out of ten, probably like this, a beloved wife or husband or sweetheart or child is gnawed to death by cancer or strangled by some other disease, and the onlooker, after praying vainly to God to refrain from such cruelty, finally repudiates his faith in the divine monster. And that is one possible reaction to say, if things like this happen, there cannot be a God. But actually, our deepest gut reaction to sickness and death points in exactly the opposite direction, because our deepest reaction is to say, this shouldn't happen. This is not the way things should be, which begs the question, where does that sense of should and shouldn't come from? Because if you are uh, an atheist, 
and you believe that we are just the chance product of evolution, you have absolutely no reason to believe that this world should be any better, any different than it is. You just have to accept that life is the nasty business of the survival of the fittest and that there is no such thing as should and shouldn't. But deep down, we don't accept that, do we? Deep down, we all want to say that sickness and death are evils. That shouldn't be. That's why we fight them. That's why so many of you are here are medics or going into medicine. And whereas atheism, on, on one hand, can't explain our sense of how things should and shouldn't be, the Bible can explain that, like nothing else. Because it says that this whole universe was created by a good God, and that in the beginning, it was good. There was no wrongdoing, no sickness, no death. And that explains our sense of what should be. It's actually a memory, a corporate memory. But the Bible also says the first human pair turned away from God, basically told him, we don't need you, we want to live as we please, and human nature has been the same ever since. And that explains human wrongdoing, but the Bible also says it explains sickness and death. Because um, just keep a, a poor or something else marmalade sandwich in Matthew 9 and turn back to page 3 of the Bible. Page 3, Genesis 3. Uh, page 3, Genesis 3, and take a look at verse 17. This is after the first human pair, Adam and Eve, had basically told God, we don't need you. And to Adam, God said, because you've listened to the, the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you will return. In other words, from now on, you are going to experience mortality, sickness, and death, as a blanket judgment, if I can put it like that. Isaiah called it that covering over the nations. I'm going to call it a blanket judgment for turning away from God. So some sickness is the specific result of specific wrongdoing. We know that, like liver failure resulting from alcohol abuse. But this is saying your and my mortality is a much more general blanket judgment on us all, where you cannot draw lines from specific um, wrongdoing to specific sicknesses. What you can do is to draw a line from our turning away from God to our mortality. And I know it sounds hard, but it is merciful that God has done that, and he's done that to bring home to us reality. Because saying to God, you know, we don't need you is completely out of touch with reality. Because the reality is he made us and sustains us every moment. Just pause, pause and feel your heart beat for a couple of goes right now. That's only happening because he is keeping it happening. You and I are on that kind of life support. So not only do we need God, we owe him our lives. And he's laid this blanket judgment of mortality on us to bring home to us that we are not independent of him, that we can't even sustain our own health, let alone our own heartbeat. And so the Bible says all of that is why we have this sense that there shouldn't be sickness and death and why we long for things to be different and are motivated to work for things to be different. And we need that background if we're going to understand what Jesus was saying about himself through these two miracles in Matthew 9. Because the beginning of the Bible also said God would send a saviour to rescue us from the consequences of our turning away from God. And by rescuing this woman from sickness and this girl from death, Jesus was saying, I am that saviour. Look this way. 
So let's turn back to Matthew 9 on page uh, 814. And uh, the first thing that it says is that Jesus can ultimately save us from sickness. Jesus can ultimately save us from sickness. Look at Matthew 9, verse 20. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years, probably bleeding from the womb, came up behind him, which begs the question, wasn't she entitled to better health than that? And presumably she couldn't have children as a result either, which is such a painful thing to have to face and which our culture would say was another entitlement gone. But the Bible says none of us is entitled to health because we are all part of this turning away from God that it speaks about. So none of us can say we deserve something or other from God any more than the rebellious teenager can say um, I claim as a right my, 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 my financial uh, allowance every week, my, uh, my privileges uh, on the television and the Xbox, my use of the car, regardless of how he treats his parents. That's not reality. So our natural reaction to situations like this woman's is to think, you know, isn't that unfair? Doesn't she deserve better health like the rest of us, whereas God wants us to think, isn't that a reminder that none of us deserves the health we've got? And that whatever health we do have is a gift. Now, you don't suffer for 12 years without trying everything you can to get better. And Mark's gospel adds that this woman had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So that begs the question, how should we think about medicine according to the Bible? Well, on the one hand, over here, medicine is a gracious gift from God. So at the same time as laying this blanket judgment on us, underneath the blanket, God has graciously given us this ability to to treat sickness and to prevent sickness. And that's a great kindness. But on the other hand, Medicine does not and cannot and will never remove that blanket judgment of mortality, which is why medicine will only ever be about the management of sickness. It will never be about the eradication of sickness. So in that sense, all of you here who are medics, for whom we're extremely grateful, you're only really in palliative care, whatever your specialty. And there will always be things medicine can't treat, There will always be imperfect health, and God allows that to bring home to us that we are not independent of him. But then comes this woman's healing. Halfway through verse 20, she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment, for she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Astonishing perception about Jesus. And he turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And by healing her, Jesus was saying, I am that promised saviour. Come to rescue you from the consequences of your turning from God. So what does this mean for us today? Well, some Christians, and you may have heard them say that, If only we had enough faith, the risen Lord Jesus would be able to do this for us every time. And that therefore, whenever you find lack of health, what you're also seeing is lack of faith. And that is badly and cruelly wrong. Because there are stacks of references in the New Testament to Christians being sick so that we can knock that idea on the head. For example, Paul wrote to the Galatians, you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. So he hadn't planned to visit Galatia, but he got sick and he decided to go there for a climate that was better for his recovery. So are we seriously going to say, if only the Apostle Paul had had more faith, he'd have had perfect health? I mean, I can't think of anyone who seemed to have had more faith than the Apostle Paul. No, the truth is Jesus said his miracles were, this is what he said, signs of the kingdom of heaven. Signs of the kingdom of heaven. To put it another way, signposts pointing forward 
to what it will be like for those trusting him beyond this life, not in this life. So as we read about this woman being instantly and completely healed, we're not reading about what we can expect now. We're reading about what we can expect when Jesus raises us from this life to the next one if we're trusting in him. Because when he does, you and I, if we're trusting in him, will be instantly and completely healed. Because we will be in resurrection bodies that are no longer under this blanket judgment of mortality. So, you know, there will be no more of these things. No more hearing aids. No more medication or inhalers or walking sticks or wheelchairs or crutches or aches or pains. There will be no more doctors or dentists or physios or nurses. No practicing ones, just to clarify that, to reassure you if you're becoming worried for your own future or that of your colleagues. There will be no more looking forward anxiously to operations uh, or to test results coming back um, or to how incurable conditions might develop. There will be no more looking back wistfully to the best days of our life when, when, when you could run or you could walk or you could remember. All of that will be over. That's what we can expect in the resurrection future, which is why my headline for this bit was Jesus can ultimately save from sickness. Whereas in the present, we will always have imperfect health and progressively imperfect health as we age. So a Christian friend in his 70s, for example, said to me, I think we oldies can be a bit of a pain in Bible study groups because when it comes to prayer time, what we tend to do is just you know, launch into this list of the latest things that have gone wrong with our bodies. The organ recital is what I like to call it, he said. Well, it's right and good to pray about our imperfect health because we believe that the Lord is able to restore health, whether or not he uses medicine in the process. So by all means, let's pray for him to do that, as well as using all the appropriate medical means at our disposal. But without claiming restored health as a, res as a, as a, as a right, without pretending to know what God's timings or plans or purposes are in sickness and sometimes in leaving us in sickness, Remembering that sometimes the answers to our prayers are no, or not yet, or even not in this life. And above all, in our imperfect health, we also need to keep our eyes riveted on what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross as the greatest demonstration of his love. And to remember that on the day when you have the accident, or the heart attack, or the Parkinson's or cancer diagnosis, that on that day, he loves you every bit as much as he did on Good Friday. We need to believe that, and I realize that that is much easier said than done. So that's the first thing here. Jesus can ultimately save us from sickness. The second thing is that Jesus can ultimately bring us through death. Jesus can ultimately bring us through death. Look down again to Matthew 9, verse 18. While Jesus was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, my daughter has just died. Every parent's nightmare. And just like the woman's situation begs the question, yeah, wasn't she entitled to more health than this? This begs the question, wasn't she entitled to more life than this? I mean, what, what happened to her three score and ten? And I guess the, the death of a child, whether through miscarriage or at any age after birth, is one of the things that most calls out from us the gut reaction, this should not happen. This is the worst of unfairnesses. And again, God wants us to be thinking, it is a reminder that none of us deserves any length of life. Where did we get three score years and ten from as a right? 
and that every day we have is an undeserved gift. So verse 18 again, this, this man says, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. Verse 23, and when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, in other words, the official funeral stuff is all underway, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. Now Jesus knew full well that she was dead. So when he said, she's sleeping, he wasn't denying the facts. He was saying, death looks totally different if you are trusting in me. Because it is as easy for me to pull someone out of death as it is for you to get someone out of bed in the morning. Although I realize that depending on the teenager in question, that too can be a semi-miraculous act. But you see what Jesus is saying? He is saying, with me, death is like falling asleep. When you go to bed tonight, you're gonna to regard that as the end? When you go to bed tonight, you're gonna to be afraid of that? When you go to bed tonight, you're not going to be thinking, this is just till I wake up tomorrow. And that's why it was Christians who, did you know, it was Christians who first called graveyards cemeteries. Cemetery is Latin for bedroom, sleeping place. Because that's all the grave is for those trusting in Jesus. Now again, what does this mean for us today? What Jesus did here was to pull this girl out of death over here back into this life here so that Matthew, amongst others, could witness it, could write it down for us so that we could say to ourselves, Jesus can even do this. He can pull out of death. But remember, Jesus said his miracles were signs of the kingdom of heaven, signs of the kingdom of heaven of heaven, pointing forward to what it will be for those trusting in him beyond this life, not to in this life. So this was a sign of how Jesus can and will pull those trusting in him through death, not back this way, but forward that way to where he is now. Because since the events of Matthew 9, Jesus has died on the cross to pay for our forgiveness. And that's why he can take us safely through that moment of judgment beyond death. And he's risen from the dead to show that he is the savior and the son of God that he claimed to be. And he's now back with his father in heaven. And if we are trusting in him, he will keep hold of us through sickness and health and finally pull us through death to be with him beyond it. I used to do a, a, a lot of climbing with a friend. Um, he was the better climber, so he always led, which means he went first, taking a greater risk, tied to a rope that was trailing behind him, clipping it into equipment where he could so that it would catch him when he fell. So if he was 10 foot above the rope, he'd swing 20 feet and then it would catch him. Um, and at the end of each pitch, he would tie himself onto the cliff and belay me up, keeping tight rope between us so it would then catch me if I fell. And there were times when I, I looked up, you know, at a kind of, you know, desperate overhang or a completely smooth wall that he managed to do and think, you know, I will never do that. But actually, when you are the second, the, the first can pretty much pull you through anything um, as you're scrabbling around, losing your handhold with that rope. And that is a picture of faith in Jesus. Faith ties you to Jesus like that rope and since Jesus has gone first through death into heaven and you are tied to him he will pull you through as well forgiven and welcome and we need to keep these two miracles just as I wrap up in that perspective that future perspective because remember they point to things what things will be like beyond this life not to what we can expect in this life and actually, if we could interview this girl or this woman right now in heaven, I'm sure they would say that they're really grateful for the quality and quantity of life that Jesus gave back to them that day. But they would also say, wouldn't they, of course, it was only a reprieve. It didn't last. 
and we both got sick again, we both got old, we both became the oldies giving the organ recital in our Bible study groups. So we are grateful for what Jesus gave us back that day, but even more grateful to have lived the whole of our lives through sickness and health, joy and suffering, knowing Jesus. And most grateful of all, to be where we are now, in heaven, where everything sad and bad has been behind us forever for the last 2,000 years. Let's pray. Father, it is not easy for us to hear that you have allowed sickness and death to bring home to us the reality that we do depend on you for life and for all that is good in life. But we bow before that and we acknowledge that we do depend on you. We also acknowledge gratefully that for many of us you have used what we have been through in sickness and difficulty, either to bring us to faith or to deepen and purify our faith. We want to thank you for the measure of health and life that we do have. We want to pray that you would keep us trusting in you in the face of sickness and aging and death. And that you would help us as a church family to know how to do that together as we encourage one another and pray for one another and bear one another's burdens. And we ask that you would help us to be confident on the strength of Jesus' death and resurrection that he will bring us to where all things sad and bad are also forever behind us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.